Before we get started, please be aware that this video does contain mentions of suicide. Please take care for those of you who that may be triggering for. Welcome back to Tidbits, everyone. My name is Christina Koopman. Thank you for joining me again. Today's video focuses on a lot of different subjects, but it all centers around the art of one man. His story is now almost a cliche in the art world. A brilliant but poor young immigrant finds fame in America. Then the tortured artist takes his own life, and yet his artwork sells for millions, setting records at auction houses decades after his death. Does his suicide change how we look at and view his art now? Can we deposit meaning where it is purposely absent? Do our modern interpretations of his artwork do a disservice to the artist? Or do we honor him by still discussing and interpreting his work? As it seems to be every week on this show, I ask questions that have no easy answers. But I think it's important to keep these things in mind as we take a look at the work of Mark Rothko. Let's take a deeper look. Mark Rothko was born Marcus Rothkowitz in Latvia in 1903. The anglicized version of his name, Mark Rothko, appears in 1940, after the rise of Nazism in America and his fear of prejudice against Jewish people. The Rothkowitz family immigrated to the U.S. in 1913, when Marcus was 10. An incredibly intelligent person, Marcus quickly accelerated through the public school system in his new home of Portland, Oregon. English was his fourth language, and he proved adept at political discussion and debate, especially centered around the beginning of the Russian Revolution in 1917. In 1921, Marcus was accepted into Yale on a scholarship. However, he found the experience isolating and unfulfilling. Intense racism and elitism towards Jewish people and immigrants meant he did not return for his second year of studies, instead moving to New York to begin studies in art. During this time, Rothko began to view art as a tool of emotional and spiritual expression. He studied under several teachers, but as a lifelong reader, one profound influence on his life and work was Friedrich Nietzsche's The Birth of Tragedy. Nietzsche claimed that Greek tragedy served to redeem man from the terrors of mortal life. In his opinion, art should dramatize the struggles and terrors of everyday existence. Rothko viewed myth as a replenishing resource for the spiritual void of this modern era, and he considered himself to be a modern myth-maker. Influenced by surrealists, abstract expressionists, and Dadaists, Rothko's style changed over time based on what was around him. I could honestly spend a whole hour talking about this period of his life, but alas, in the interest of time, we must move on. His signature style developed in the 1940s with the creation of multiforms. Rothko never used the term multiform himself. Instead, he described these paintings as possessing a more organic structure, as self-contained units of human expression. For him, these blurred blocks of various colors, devoid of landscape or the human figure, let alone myth and symbol, possessed their own life force. They contained a breath of life he found lacking in most figurative paintings of the era. The multiforms brought Rothko to a realization of his signature style of rectangular regions of color, which he continued to produce for the rest of his life. Very large-scale designs were used in order to overwhelm the viewer, or, in Rothko's words, to make the viewer feel enveloped within the painting. For some critics, the large size was an attempt to make up for a lack of substance. In retaliation, Rothko stated, quote, I realize that historically the function of painting large pictures is painting something very grandiose and pompous. The reason I paint them, however, is precisely because I want to be very intimate and human. To paint a small picture is to place yourself outside your experience, to look upon an experience. However you paint the larger picture, you are in it. It isn't something you command." End quote. He even went so far as to recommend that viewers position themselves as little as 18 inches away from the canvas, 
so that they might experience a sense of intimacy, as well as awe, a transcendence of the individual and a sense of the unknown. A growing darkness in his personal life was reflected in his work. Separation and divorce from his wife, as well as the death of his mother, are reflected in his color palette, as darker blues and maroons replace the bright yellows and hardy oranges. Despite his growing fame, Rothko felt a growing personal seclusion and a sense of being misunderstood as an artist. He feared that people purchased his paintings simply out of fashion, and that the true purpose of his work was not being grasped by collectors, critics, or audiences. He wanted his paintings to move beyond abstraction. For Rothko, the paintings were objects that possessed their own form and potential, and therefore must be encountered as such. Sensing the futility of words and describing this decidedly non-verbal aspect of his work, Rothko abandoned all attempts at responding to those who inquired after its meaning and purpose, stating finally that, quote, silence is so accurate. My painting surfaces are expansive and push outward in all directions, or their surfaces contract and rush inward in all directions. Between these two poles, you can find everything I want to say. End quote. In 1958, Rothko was awarded the first of two major mural commissions, which proved both rewarding and frustrating. The beverage company Joseph Seagram & Sons had recently completed the new Seagram Building skyscraper on Park Avenue. Rothko agreed to provide paintings for the building's new luxury restaurant, The Four Seasons. Over the following three months, Rothko completed 40 paintings, comprising three full series in dark red and brown. The following June, Rothko took a break from the commission and traveled to Europe. In Florence, he visited Michelangelo's Laurentian Library to see firsthand the library's vestibule, from which he drew further inspiration for the murals. He remarked that, quote, the room had exactly the feeling that I wanted. It gives the visitor the feeling of being caught in a room with the doors and windows walled in shut." End quote. The library is an example of art meant not for function, but to deliberately alter your sense of space as the audience. This was Rothko's goal for his murals, the allusion to space, windows, doors, and portals, but ones which ultimately led nowhere. Seeing work in spaces it was designed for, rather than museums, was revelatory. He became fascinated with the idea of creating a room with his art, using abstract painting as a type of architecture. Once back in New York, Rothko visited the nearly completed Four Seasons restaurant. Upset with the restaurant's dining atmosphere, which he considered pretentious and inappropriate for the display of his works, Rothko refused to continue the project and returned his cash advanced to Seagram. Given that Rothko had known in advance about the luxury decor of the restaurant and the social class of its future patrons, the motives for his abrupt repudiation remain mysterious. In a letter to another artist, Rothko elaborates, quote, When I returned, I looked again at my paintings and then visited the premises for which they were destined. It seemed clear to me at once that the two were not for each other." End quote. The murals went into storage until 1968, and Rothko's personal and professional isolation and depression deepened. He separated from his second wife, moved into his studio, and continued a life of excess drinking, smoking, and a poor diet. On the 25th of February, 1970, the Tate Gallery in London received nine Mark Rothko canvases, a generous donation from the artist himself. A few hours later, Rothko was found dead in his studio on East 69th Street in Manhattan. The 66-year-old painter had taken his own life. After his death, the Tate Gallery set up a gallery of his works to his exact specifications in a room of their own, a room which has an uncanny silence to it. In an increasingly secular age, Rothko's room has taken on the aura of a temple or shrine. It is somewhere to sit quietly with one's thoughts. Rothko aspired to create in the viewer a feeling of contemplation, of transcendence, of having been transported to another pure world. For Rothko, a painting is not a picture of an experience, 
but it is the experience itself.